start recording again. Okay. Okay, so the coronary arteries are branching off the aortic semilunar valve right below it. You can see them on the side. When the act, the coronary arteries fill during diastole, which is good because that's when we need the heart to receive its oxygen when it's about to contract muscles. Those are the only vessels that fill during ventricular relaxation because when the valve is closed, it actually opens the flow to the coronary arteries. This is kind of a cool, cool thing the way that works. Um, talk about that. The other part of the working of the heart is contraction and cardiac contraction has to do with alignment, which is what this slide is saying, alignment between the actin and myosin filaments of those cardiac myocytes. So we have our actin myofilaments that sort of look like um, chains that have little circles on them. And then we have our myosin filaments that look like little kind of paddles. And normally where you see all those little circles here, those have caps on them, they're covered so that the actin and myosin um, filaments aren't relaxed, they're not meeting, there's not a change in the position of the muscle at all. In response to the action potential, once the cardiac myocyte depolarizes, there is an influx of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the muscle. There will be an influx of calcium into the heart cell, which will pull the troponin caps, that's what they're called, off those actin filaments so that now the myosin, myosin can interact with the actin and it'll force, it'll cause contraction, it'll shorten this muscle, make it smaller. So when the heart is at, which is what this picture is showing you, obviously it looks a lot cuter than mine. In normal circumstances, the actual lineup of the actin and myosin microfilaments is not as efficient as possible. There's some overlap. They're like this. So that when the muscle shortens, it, it does shorten, but it's not as good as it could be. So, which means we have a, just like the veins have a built-in um, reserve, so too does the cardiac muscle itself. Because if we increase activity and our skeletal muscles milk the veins to increase the amount of blood that returns to the heart, not what we will then do is stretch the heart muscle and actually line up the muscle fibers better when they're stretched out. So our contraction will actually be stronger. That's our built-in reserve um, to our cardiac output, which leads us to the last part of this discussion of cardiac function, which is cardiac output itself. So cardiac output is the amount of blood the heart pumps each minute, which is determined by stroke volume and heart rate. So obviously heart rate is the number of beats per minute that's sort of determined by sympathetic or parasympathetic outflow to the SA node, changing the rapidity of um, action potential of the pacemaker is one huge, the huge input on that. But stroke volume is determined by several factors, which is preload, afterload, and contractility, which I, is a concept that's talked about in undergrad, so it's, it's something that you might have a vague remember of. Preload is, is blood volume. So what I've told undergraduates before is like preload is like P, it's fluid. It's the fluid that the heart has to pump. Afterload 
is the arteries essentially is, is what determines it. It's the pressure that the pump has to overcome in order to get fluid out. So it's like, um, it's determined by peripheral vascular resistance. If the blood pressure is up, it's harder to pump. So it's sort of like the blood pressure would be the dumbbell with lots of weight on it. It makes it harder for the heart to contract if you have to push against resistance. And if there's more fluid to move or more volume to move, that is more work as well. And then, of course, we need the muscle to be at its peak performance. So it won't, we won't have the same stroke volume, um, you know, if we are just at rest as we would if we increase cardiac demand to increase preload, then we could increase cardiac output in terms of our, the needs of our body. That's how it's supposed to work. So what we've been talking about in terms of cardiac reserve or the, the ability to make the contraction more efficient to reach and to, um, in order to meet cardiac demand is sometimes called Frank Starling mechanism, which is the greater the volume of blood in the heart before contraction, the greater the volume of blood ejected from the heart. And it's because of the change in the lineup of those muscle fibers. I will create a better, um, more efficient contraction. Of course, there is a time when this becomes less, you can only stretch it apart so far. If it, the cardiac, um, if the preload is so great that the fibers are stretched out too far that they can't even meet each other, then of course the contraction will be terrible. So this is to a point, of course, when we talk about heart failure. And so cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Heart rate is determined by the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, those different neural reflexes, um, like the hemoreceptors, baroreceptors, hormones, Stroke volume is determined by preload, afterload, and contractility. Preload is venous return. Um, afterload is total peripheral resistance. Contractility is determined by the amount of blood that's in the ventricle, the amount of sympathetic stimulation, and the oxygen supply of the heart. So that is your crash course into normal cardiac function to get to cardiac dysfunction. And so that's what the last part of the lecture is gonna be out about hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, and in particular, heart failure. So before we get into that, let's take another little break till 840. Um, and then we'll uh, do the last deck of slides. So I'm gonna... So now we are going to go into cardiovascular dysfunction. So I did restart recording. Let me just share my screen again. If I can get on the right thing. Here we go. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is hypertension, which obviously as nurses, we are certainly all familiar with um, Joint National Committee. JMC it produces guidelines for a lot of different diseases, excuse me, especially cardiovascular disease. And they did recently change the hypertension guidelines. They're a little bit more strict, although not every healthcare provider or family practitioner or internal medicine provider has gone along with these tighter guidelines, but the stages of hypertension, um, would be you this when I first started as a nurse stage one was considered prehypertension and now that would be considered a treatable blood pressure um, to some providers especially I think with younger patients because the thought is that we know that hypertension is associated with cardiovascular disease and that hypertension causes end organ failure then the best we can do is to jump on hypertension early with treatments. Primary hypertension is 
a multifactorial problem. There is likely a genetic um, factor to it that increases the likelihood of hypertension, especially operating in some families, but it's not solely genetic. There are other um, factors that can complicate or increase high blood pressure, including factors that people have control over, such as their diet, smoking, physical activity, um, things they don't have control over, like um, their ethnicity or their age. Um, and some of the factors that might be genetic would be overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, as well as those other um, peptides. So it's likely a combination of all of those things, things, things changing as you age, um, certain lifestyle things that increase the likelihood of hypertension and genetics that could increase, that could also be implicated in increasing the activity of some of these hormonal systems or our sympathetic nervous system. Um, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction can happen um, related to, uh, you know, the changes in our lipid, lipid metabolism. And obesity and insulin resistance, insulin resistance also contribute greatly to hypertension. So every six pounds of fat is considered an organ, actually, because it, it will start to produce its own hormones. It will produce hormones that increase insulin resistance. It will produce hormones that favor clot formation as well as increased blood pressure. So one of the best things that anyone with hypertension can do is lose weight. So this is a schematic looking at the factors that would increase the likelihood of blood pressure. Genetics um, and the environment increase the possibility of inflammation, of the our hormone systems being activated, and obesity increases the possibility of vasoconstriction, which in, in turn increases water retention. And that increased peripheral vascular resistance and increased blood volume will cause sustained hypertension. And the problem here is that sustained hypertension leads to vascular remodeling and atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. So when that occurs, we will start to see end organ disease, such as um, less blood flow to the brain, leading to increases in dementia and stroke, less blood flow to the heart, potential coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure, renal disease, and eye changes. So if we increase the stimulus to those smooth muscle cells that line the vessel, we are increasing the stress to those smooth muscle cells and that will cause hypertrophy of those cells and eventually sclerosis or scarring. And that is what vascular remodeling means. So this picture is actually the cross section of an artery, which should be, you know, just the tunica media and endothelial layer, a nice clear layer. This is the lumen of that vessel now. And this is the outer layer of the vessel and then in here is vascular remodeling that's taken place and even an area of necrosis here. So obviously this flow will definitely be decreased given that that diameter is um, so low. And so these are just pictures of what can happen to the peripheral vessels leading to changes in the kidneys the skin, the eyes, the brain. And so anything that we can do to stop this process, we will help um, stop the vascular remodeling and increase blood flow to our essential organs. But most of the time, people with hypertension will also 
can have hyperlipidemia and people with hyperlipidemia could also have hypertension. They often occur together and they exacerbate each other. Hyperlipidemia could be a genetic disorder. There is a genetic component and it can be dominant in some families, but most of the time it's related to secondary factors with an increase in circulating cholesterol. Um, those cholesterol, the way cholesterol travels through the body, it is sort of packaged in the liver. So when we eat, when we eat, here's our esophagus going down into our stomach and then the first part of the small intestine, and here's our liver, we have that, we have a special circulation um, between the liver and the small intestine, the portal circulation. And that is how our body helps protect us from toxins and helps metabolize drugs because there's always what's called a first pass. Some, a lot of the things that are in the small intestine that we eat or ingest, I should say, some of those things like alcohol and drugs and, and things will pass through the liver first for detoxification. Well, one of the things that passes through the liver first is um, cholesterol and triglycerides. When we eat them, they will go into the portal circulation into the liver to be packaged with protein into the body. So there are several types of these molecules and they have different concentrations of fat, protein and cholesterol. The lightest, smallest ones are chylomicrons, which are just mostly triglyceride and a small amount of protein. Very low density um, lipoproteins have a portion of triglyceride, a portion of cholesterol and some proteins to carry them around. Low density lipoproteins and intermediate density lipoproteins are left over from metabolism of very low density lipoproteins by cells. And then we have the HDL, which are the high density lipoproteins, which are primarily proteins, kind of cassettes, sort of remind me of little Roombas. So they're constantly sort of circulating and then they're gonna pick up the extra LDL and IDLs left over from metabolism of the cholesterol because we do need cholesterol. It isn't without purpose. Our, all of our cell membranes have cholesterol in them. And so we need cholesterol for repair of our cell membranes. And then we do need cholesterol for the formation of several types of hormones. And so it's not like we don't need it. The issue happens when we have more than this system is ready to accommodate. So this is the same picture. We threw um, during digestion, the you know cholesterol goes into the liver to be packaged to go to the cells. And then the high density lipoproteins are supposed to get rid of ex excess cholesterol to be recycled in the liver. The problem that occurs is when the cholesterol starts to coat the inside of the, the um, endothelial layer of the blood vessels. And there are kind of a couple of things that collide together. There can be weaknesses um, in the blood vessel themselves because of hypertension or other injury to endothelial cells, which make certain sections of the blood vessels um, the best places for plaque to deposit. So if I have, um, maybe it's an area of bifurcation where there's a lot of turbulent flow and so there's been some friction damage to the vessel like we saw in that first picture from the first, first bunch of slides. If I had, um, if when I have hypertension and I push it, there's more resistance on the vessel so I'm pushing through blood, there can be a lot of friction injury to endothelial cells just because of the tension that the vessel is on. So hypertension contributes to inflammation 
of endothelial cells because of friction injury. So that makes it more vulnerable to cholesterol uh, plaque development in that area. Smoking damages endothelial cells and again can trigger the immune response and can be a perfect place for cholesterol to deposit. And what happens is the excess cholesterol that's circulating in the blood vessel and here's our endothelial cells and that subendothelial space uh, where we have some clotting factors and that tissue factor and things that are protecting our vessel. Um, if we have excess LDL in the vulnerable area where there's already inflammation and friction damage, we've used, the cells have used the lipids that they need, the um, HDLs that were available have tried to reverse transport the byproducts back to the liver for recycling. If there's still LDL circulating, the scavenger pathway will be activated. And that means that monocytes that are in the vessels will engulf the LDL. And when they do that, their lysosomes will interact with the LDL. And instead of, we want, when, when the macrophage is, there's phagocytosis of foreign body, like infectious material, those lysosomes break it down into little tiny pieces and the macrophage can get rid of that or use it to present to the immune system. But when the lysosomes interact with LDL, all they do is chop up fat so the macrophage becomes a foam cell. It's not useful at all. And that foam cell will start to, it might be kind of here. So here's our little friction damage. Oh, I was trying to make that bigger instead I drew on it. Here's our friction damage to the endothelial cell. Here's our monocyte, some platelets, some lipids. The monocyte, the lipids can easily go underneath the endothelial cells um, when there's damage. Um, this macrophage is a foam cell. It can go through. Here's some more monocytes that are going to take up that fat. And here we have what becomes this plaque, which is these are macrophages that are full of fat um, and, and cholesterol. Now in that area of damaged endothelial cells, we have what's called a fatty streak. What our body does, having that fatty streak and disruption of the endothelial cells is a trigger to try to cap off this area. So there will be an increase in collagen and um, fibrous tissue to try to cap or cover up that plaque. To, in, it's the body's way to protect us from the plaque but in fact can make it uh, more likely to cause turbulent blood flow and potentially lead to clot formation, or the cap can crack, which can lead to bleeding and clot formation. So the fact that that um, foam cell is there, that there is this collection of lipids and um, macrophages there, causes an increase in um, migration of smooth muscle and creation of this fibrous cap. And that leads to potential for increase in thrombus um, production. And it definitely decreases the lumen of the blood vessel. So if I have atherosclerosis, I'm going to increase the thickness of the tunica media making the radius of the lumen smaller. And so that's vascular remodeling atherosclerosis of the blood vessel. And I, if I could have atherosclerosis or hardening of the artery because I have laid down a lipid plaque and decreased the lumen of the blood vessel, or I could have both, which is often what's occurred which means I have this decreased lumen because of the 
blood vessel, um, because of the tunica media being oops, enlarged. And then if I add a plaque in here, I can severely decrease the lumen for blood to flow. Because a lot of times people have those processes together. So endothelial injury um, facilitates um, deposition of foam cells as much as having extra lipids in general, smooth muscle proliferation leading to abnormal vas vasoconstriction, the fibrous calcification of the plaque can lead to ulceration, rupture, or thrombus formation in the vessel. So both of those are bad. And they often happen together, and that means there's a decreased flow to essential organs. And this blood vessel that has this vascular remodeling and decreased lumen does not respond well to changes in the local environment. So we're supposed to be able to dilate blood vessels based on um, local needs of tissue. You know, if I'm exercising my arm, I would want there to be an increase in blood flow to the muscle that I'm exercising so that that muscle can get oxygen. Those local, local um, vasodilators released by endothelial cells, that's going to be much less responsive in this situation. So the rest of the lecture has to do with valve and heart failure. So the first part is valve disorders. There are two main types of valve disorders, either regurgitation or stenosis. Stenosis means when the valve is supposed to open, it doesn't open up all the way. And regurgitation means that when the valve is supposed to close, it doesn't close all the way. So you have to, when you're thinking of valvular disorders, you have to think of which valve we're talking about, which phase of the cardiac cycle we're in to determine if that valve is supposed to be open or closed, and what will happen, how will the blood flow direction go? Because that will determine the symptoms the patient is having. So mitral valve stenosis means that the valve, the mitral valve, isn't opening up all the way. It's supposed to be open during diastole. I always do that. So here's my um, heart. Here's the left side. So we're talking about this valve. During diastole, that valve is supposed to be open to allow for passive filling into the ventricle. If that valve cannot open up all the way, then it's going to be hard to fill the ventricle. So that's going to increase pressure in the left atrium because there's still going to be filling of blood from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. So if that fluid can't get into the left ventricle, there's increased pressure and in fluid in the left atrium and then potentially over time could cause backflow into the lungs. So I know the problem is occurring during diastole because that's when the valve is supposed to be open and it's not opening. So the left atria is distended and there could be pulmonary congestion. This particular valve disorder is associated with rheumatic fever, um, which could also also could mean strep infections over time. It's progressive and lifelong. The atrial fibrillation or increased electrical activity in the atrium is because of the increase in left atrial pressure. And this is a picture of a stenotic valve. See, it's not very calcified. It's not gonna open up very well. Okay, now the other thing, the other possibility would be mitral valve regurgitation. So regurgitation means we're at the point where the valve is supposed to be closed. So here's our heart, the left side, left atrium, left ventricle. It's this valve 
that valve is supposed to be closed during systole. So we already know this is a systolic problem. During systole, the atria is supposed to be, sorry, the, um, this valve should be closed so that when the heart ejects blood into the aorta, there's no reverse flow into the atrium. If this valve is closed, then during systole, when the ventricle contracts, there will be flow into the aorta, but there will also be backflow into the left atrium. So we might have similar symptoms in that there would be less an increase in pressure in the left atrium, which predisposes to atrial fibrillation, and a backflow into the lungs, which could lead to um, pulmonary congestion. The only difference is we could also have left ventricle enlargement because um, there might be over time, we're going to have an increase in blood volume in the ventricle to begin with. But we might not really notice much. The patient themselves might complain of shortness of breath and cough and not being able to, to have the same activity tolerance. And the problem is here, we might not be able to tell, except we might be able to tell if we listened to the heart if the problem is during diastole versus the problem is during systole. So if we remember that S1 and S2, this is systole and this is diastole. When we're listening for a murmur, we're listening for turbulent flow. If the turbulent flow occurs during systole, then this would be the potential time where we might hear mitral regurgs. If the turbulent flow is occurring during diastole, this might be the time when we would hear mitral stenosis. So the patient's symptoms might be similar, but we will hear the turbulent flow at a different point in the cardiac cycle, which is sometimes people stop relying on their physical assessment because, I mean, ultimately, you're going to get an echocardiogram, which would pinpoint the problem exactly and measure the per percentage or degree of dysfunction. But you can, you can actually pick up a lot of this stuff on physical exam. Mitral valve prolapse is a different disorder that can occur um, with the mitral valve in particular, in which there's mucinous degeneration or sort of like jelly. Um, in the valve leaflets itself. So instead of maintaining that fibrous skeleton of the valve, it becomes kind of floppy and jelly-like. So when it, sometimes what that means when it's uh, not as strong of a problem, when it's a small degree of mitral prolapse, when the valve is supposed to close, it sometimes bounces upwards. So people feel like a weird palpitation because there's like, um, bubbling or fluid turbulence of flow in the atria when it closes because it's like whoop, it's like bubbling to the most severe where it actually causes a regurgitation okay now we're moving on to a different valve the aorta so the aortic semilunar valve is supposed to be open during systole and closed during diastole. So aortic stenosis would be a systolic problem because the aorta is supposed to be open at that time. So here's my heart. Here's the left side of the heart. We're going out to the aorta. This is the valve we're talking about. When the left ventricle contracts, the semilunar valve should be open to allow ejection of blood into the aorta. If this valve is stenotic, it's not going to open all the way. So it's going to be very hard to eject the blood out of this stenotic valve. It actually increases resistance to ventricular contraction, similar to 
an increase in peripheral vascular resistance, except this time it's from the valve itself. So it's very, very hard on the heart. It's a lot of work on the heart to have to push blood through a tiny opening. So the first thing that will happen because of that increased stress is an increase in muscle size, um, ventricular muscle hypertrophy, hyperplasia, because of the excess stimulation in order to get more blood out. Just like if I increased weight on a dumbbell or a barbell and I kept working against resistance, my muscle should increase, my muscle size should increase. That's what happens to the ventricle when it's pumping against the stenotic valve. Over time, however, that will lead to progressive pressure overload. And eventually, the, we, the coronary arteries will not be able to fill the oxygen demand of that, of that um, ventricle, which will lead to heart failure. So that's the stenotic aortic valve. If we're aortic regurgitation, again, the aortic semilunar valve is supposed to be closed during diastole. So this means that um, it is open during diastole. So this is a diastolic problem. And then what will happen is it's time for passive filling from the left atrium into the left ventricle, and this valve should be closed because we just ejected this volume of blood and we want the elastic recoil of the aorta to push the blood forward. But if this valve is open or doesn't close right all the way, then not all of the blood volume that we wanted to push forward will go forward. Some of it will back into the ventricle again. And so we're gonna progressively increase volume in the left ventricle, overstretching it to the point where we lose the ability to have a good muscle contraction. So having valve disorders of the aorta is a definite reason to develop different types of heart failure. The other reason why people can develop heart failure, especially adults, is hypertension. You certainly can develop heart failure for all kinds of reasons. You could have a heart attack, you could have a viral infection that changed the muscle of your heart, you could have a congenital abnormality that changed your muscle function. Um, there's many reasons why people develop heart failure. The most common reason for adults in the United States to develop heart failure is hypertension. Heart failure itself means the heart is not able to generate enough cardiac output to meet oxygen demand of the body. So it's the ability, inability of the heart to supply the metabolism of the body with adequate volume and pressure. And so here's our biggest risk factors. Heart failure can be classified in multiple different ways. So Typically, how you may have spoken about heart failure before is usually around the idea of congestive heart failure or left-sided heart failure. Um, heart failure can be divided into left and right-sided failure, and it can also be divided into diastolic or systolic failure, which is sometimes referred to as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with, um, ooh, I just touched my volume, heart failure with um, where the ejection fraction remains the same. So I hope I didn't touch my volume too much because I just leaned on this stupid thing. All right, so let's say, so heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And oftentimes, at least in terms of hypertension, not necessarily cardiac ischemia, but at least in terms of hypertension, there is a natural progression of heart failure. So here's my heart. Um, 
we just we talked about the determinants of cardiac output, which was stroke volume and heart rate. And stroke volume is determined by preload, which is the amount of blood that's returned to the ventricle. Afterload, which is the amount of resistance the heart has to pump against, as well as the quality of the muscle itself, cardiac contractility. So if somebody has high blood pressure, then there's an increase in arterial vascular resistance which means there's an increase in afterload. So we have increased the work of the heart. When we increase the work and stimulation of anything, we, the cellular adaption that we learned about in the first class is hypertrophy and sometimes hyperplasia or both. So we would expect that over time, we should see less ventricular hypertrophy related to the increased workload of hypertension, because there's never a break. You know, if I was going to exercise, I would not exercise continuously. I would take breaks. Someone who has high blood pressure, their heart never gets the break. They're under constant increased work, which will lead to ventricular hypertrophy. When that occurs, if we, if this is the ventricle, it's supposed to be, and now the ventricle is like this, because of the hypertrophy, you can clearly see that there is a decrease in the, in the chamber size. I can obviously put a lot more into this cup than I can put into this cup. So having left ventricular hypertrophy means a decrease in the ventricle size, chamber size. The actual ventricle has hypertrophy, but the area to fill is much smaller. So perhaps normally at rest, I have no symptoms because the heart fills normally and the chamber, though smaller, is enough to meet my needs during general activity. And so I'm meeting oxygen demand, I'm meeting metabolic demand of my tissues. And so here I am sitting at rest. I don't have any symptoms except for my high blood pressure. However, when I try to increase my activity, here's me and here's my left ventricle with a decreased chamber size. When I increase activity, that means my skeletal muscles will be milking veins to increase preload I'm going to use some of my venous reserve, and there should be an increase in return to the right side of the heart and into the lungs, and then there should be an increased volume coming into this left ventricle to pump out into the system that now has an increase in oxygen demand. However, I cannot fill the chamber with the amount of fluid that's needed because the chamber is too small. This is diastolic failure. So when I am exercising, I will start to feel lightheaded and short of breath and like this isn't working because I'm not able to meet the oxygen demand of exercise. So the person will sit down, they'll stop. So that's diastolic failure because normally the ejection fraction is adequate. So sometimes this is called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's when I try to increase the preload, when I try to increase cardiac re vascular return because I'm increasing activity, I'm not able to meet that demand. So that's diastolic heart failure, not to be confused with other types of heart failure systolic heart failure um, or reduced ejection fraction heart failure where the person will have symptoms all the time sometimes. Diastolic heart failure is often the first step on the road towards systolic heart failure in the hypertensive patient. So over time, this very thick left ventricle is going to get thicker and thicker and thicker. This thick ventricle 
the coronary arteries might not be able to meet the oxygen demands of this larger muscle. They're not made for that. And so there may be areas that, that um, have to deal with ischemia sometimes. There will be what's called ventricular remodeling over time. And this muscle will not be the healthy actin myosin muscle tissue that we are used to. It'll start to be um, because of vascular remodeling and changes related to increased angiotensin two, it might start to be that dilated ventricle. It's a little bit bigger. And that's when we have issues with systolic failure because now we know from Frank Starling's law that if we increase the volume, if we increase the preload or increase the volume in the ventricle, we can increase and make contraction more efficient, but only to a point. Once we start to stretch this too far, those muscle fibers don't line up good enough anymore and our contraction is weaker. If we have a weak contraction, we have a decrease in ejection from the, from the heart. That's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because our systole is inadequate. And that means over time, the blood will back into the left atrium and eventually into the lungs. And this is the person that will have um, more continuous symptoms where they might, especially when the heart failure is exacerbated, have congestion in the lungs, they'll be coughing, they might have a productive cough, they won't be able to lay flat in bed. Um, they're the ones that are going to have the symptoms all the time because this problem is occurring all the time. It's not just when we're trying to increase activity. So that's the difference between diastolic and systolic. Left heart failure is always going to cause issues in the lungs. However, left heart failure can lead to right heart failure over time. Because if my lungs, through constant backflow of fluid into the pulmonary veins, if there's an increase in fluid in the pulmonary veins, there's an increase in hydrostatic pressure. And we know from the first classes that an increase in vessel hydrostatic pressure is a force increases filtration which means we will end up with fluid in the tissues of the lungs. Fluid in the tissue of the lungs means an increased pressure on that pulmonary artery. That's the artery that's going into the lungs, which is similar to an increase. It's an external compression of that vessel which can increase pressure on the pulmonary artery, which is increasing afterload. So eventually we're going to cause failure to the right side of the heart from an increase in pressure in the lungs. And so you can start out with hypertension that leads to dis diastolic failure, that leads to systolic failure, that leads to right-sided failure. So now it's not just fluid in the lungs, but also fluid in the system. So they have edema in the lower extremity. You can start out with just right-sided failure from pul genetic pulmonary hypertension or some other respiratory abnormality. You can start out with just systolic failure because of muscle dysfunction after an MI or viral infection. It just depends on how everything first started. But the end game is a change in um, output or a change in the ability to meet cardiac needs. I'm just going through this is the things we're talking about. There's stuff about treatment here, but you do not have to worry about treatment. And that's right-sided heart failure. So left-sided, characteristic of left-sided heart failure is pulmonary edema, um, clinical manifestations of that pulmonary edema, and it's the event that left-sided heart failure that causes pulmonary edema is systolic heart failure. Diastolic Left-sided diastolic heart failure will, the patient will have dyspnea and shortness of breath, but only when they're trying to increase cardiac output. 
because they're not able to fill. Right-sided failure will be peripheral edema, and so the clinical manifestations are different. And then um, it's the inability of the heart to provide adequate flow to the pulmonary circulation. So that could be because of prolonged left-sided failure or some other pulmonary problem. You can also have high output heart failure, meaning that the heart itself is working, but you're not able to meet, it's not able to keep up with the needs of the body because of other problems. So we talked about one of those problems, which was anemia. So the heart will probably try to work harder in order to meet the oxygen demands of someone with not enough oxygen in their red blood cells. Um, which is part of the reason why they might develop tachycardia or issues with their heart function. With sepsis or hypothyroidism or anything that on its own is causing an increase in oxygen demand can cause a high output failure. There's a lot of stress on the heart. And so that is heart failure. The important thing is the distinction between diastolic and systolic because there always ends up being questions about that. Um, people hear heart failure and they automatically think lung congestion. But if the person has diastolic failure, they don't have symptoms until they try to increase filling of the ventricle. So they don't have symptoms all the time is the key. So that's the material for today. I will... Um, Post these recordings. Remember, go. You could go to YouTube as well, and see these lectures as video recordings, not just me speaking, because um, I did record these lectures when the pandemic first started to um, um, heart. And so, if you go to YouTube, my channel name is my name is Kathy Schultz, and there's a goofy cartoon picture of me saying, "Don't touch your face." That's being clever when the pandemic started. Sure. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't post that today. And I have to open up the case study. And which I can do right now. And I'm hoping to finish the exams tonight and tomorrow from exam three. Because then we'll have the case four and exam four to grade. So I'm waiting through. Uh, and then I'm meeting with a bunch of you guys coming up, which will be very exciting. And otherwise, I will see you guys when I have appointments with you or I'll uh, see you next week.